is Kaisa Johnson, a uh, phenomenal artist here from Los Angeles. And I told her, I said, you're the only artist that I've ever introduced where I really felt like I needed to wear, as Emily said, my smart glasses and read from a page. <laughs> because what she does is so um, intricate, it's so intellectual, but what she's really done is meld these two incredible worlds of art and science. And I wish that I could explain it to you, but I really can't as well as she. So I'm going to turn it over to Kaisa. Um, and what we're going to do is she's going to give us a little slide presentation so you understand her language and her vocabulary, or as she says, her alphabet. And then she's going to walk us through the exhibition. As she calls it, these are sort of her four seasons. So I'm going to turn it over to Kaisa. Okay. Hello. Can everyone? <laughs> 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 Um, thank you for coming. Um, I always preface any talk with the fact that I am a nervous <laughs> public speaker. <laughs> Maybe Leo can come help me. Um, but I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a background about where I come from in terms of my work and how it relates to this larger body of work before I take you through that. Um, so what we're looking at here well, let me start at the beginning. Um, I had an amazing science teacher in high school named Mr. Francis. And he got me so excited about the natural world and about chemistry and about physics. And he used to do things like jump up on the desk and like jump down and make up romance stories about different chemical bonds and all this stuff. And ever since my experience with him, I had this wonder and fascination and love for the natural world, and how we can understand our place in the universe through science. So um, I found myself at art school in Glasgow, Scotland, and I kind of didn't know what I wanted to talk about. I knew that you know, I wanted to make art, but I, I, didn't, I hadn't yet married these two loves of art and science together. And I was reading a pop science book on quantum physics, and I came across these marks, these particle decay patterns. So these are my drawings of particle decay patterns, but they are real pathways that unstable subatomic particles move through space and time as they decay into more stable particles. And so these different patterns are a reference point for someone who's looking at like a you know, imagery from uh, the CERN particle collider, they can see these certain movements and know that there is a mass and a weight that makes them move a certain way, and therefore it's a pion or a kaon or a maon. Um, and so when I came across these patterns, I was deep in the art school mindset of thinking about mark making and drawing and, and really defining myself as like a drawer rather than a painter. and. When I saw these, I was like, oh my god, the universe is drawing at the most basic level. So this thing that I'm thinking about all the time is actually happening all around us and making us and you know, is this expression of the overarching theme of life, which is you know, birth and decay and transformation. So I kind of stole these marks and turned them into my alphabet to make um, paintings with. Here's an early one um, that is using a medium that I've used uh, since art school also, chalk on blackboard, because I like the reference to science. Um, and I also think you're really able to see the marks well when I'm using that medium. Um, there is a detail. And you may notice when I walk you through that the, the works on the back wall use these same marks, and I'll like point them out to you. Um, and then this is one that I made using particle decay patterns um, and using ink, which is the same medium that I'm using for the glossy black ones. Um, and these, I wasn't using any um, imagery for the composition. I was just taking the marks and drawing them over and over and over again to get a sense of movement and mass congealing. And there's a close-up. 
Um, and I always notate the patterns because I want you to understand that there is this science origin and that they actually represent something real and it's not just me like making random marks because it looks like that really. <laughs> Okay, then um, I moved on to looking at different microscopic parts of our natural world, um, like diseases and their cures um, and other things. I was sort of interested in the fact that diseases are terrible for us, but if we remove ourselves from the equation, they're these actually really beautiful structures. So this is tuberculosis. Um, and this is a 16-foot drawing I did of tuberculosis. It's kind of hard to see all the little tubers, but I was taking this, uh, these shapes and how they clump together and then repeating it over large scale. And there's a detail. Okay. And this is um, pneumonia. And here's pneumonia. Let's see. Go, whooping cough. Um, whooping cough was the first time that I used watercolor, which you'll see again used over here. Um, and this sounds awful. I really wanted to like use this like phlegm and blood, and, like use those colors, but then to render it in this really beautiful way. Um, and there's a detail of that. Um, and then I did one, I showed these paintings all together with one cure, which will cure all of them, which is penicillin. So here's penicillin, that's actual penicillin, and then my drawing of penicillin. And these all showed at the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C., and that was my first solo show, so I was really excited that I was able to show the work in that environment. And there's the detail. Okay, then I moved on to this, um, I added another layer to my process where I started using historical art imagery that related in some way conceptually to the micro pattern that I was using. So I found all these old science books on the street on the Upper West Side one day, and I was flipping through them, and I found there's a whole chapter on asexually reproducing organisms. Um, and these are some of those. And at the same time, I was looking at El Greco and his Immaculate Conception paintings, and I was like, oh my God, here's Immaculate Conception in nature, and here is this Immaculate Conception in like our human story. And so I started using Immaculate Conception um, compositions as a basis for my work. So another asexually reproducing organism is yeast. So I did a lot of Immaculate Conceptions using the yeast colonies and they look like flowers and they're really pretty. Um, and there's a close-up, you can see there's all these individual pieces that make up the larger image. So, what are we on now? Oh, then I carried that theme forward, um, looking at uh, diseases and their cures and then using battle paintings. So that's plague and streptomyces. And then I made a version of Uccello's, one of Uccello's battle paintings. And you can see, again, there's all of these smaller elements making up the larger composition. Um, there's the original. Okay, and there's another battle painting. Uh, so, all right, so this brings me to um, the first really large scale work that I did, which was at the Aldrich Museum in Connecticut. And this was the first time that I started thinking about place when I was making a work. Um, so this is this wall they had called the art wall that was 15 by 15 feet and they would invite artists to come and work on the wall and propose something for it. So I came back to them with these four different proposals that all used the entire wall and they were like, no one's ever suggested using the entire wall before. I was like, how would you not use all of the wall? Like, it's just asking to be drawn on. So. I did a piece for them that was based on spores that would come from um, the trees on their property. So I researched all the, the trees and then what spores would, you know, what they looked like when they would come from them. And then I, I based the larger composition on wind patterns. So, and that's some of the spores that you can see. That's me making it. I had this great lift that I loved so much. 
go up and down. Um, and then this, the other series I showed alongside that in the room that I had in the museum um, used the shape of environmental pollutants to make up the compositions of Hudson River School uh, compositions because I wanted to look at this idea of utopia that existed in um, the Hudson River School and compare it to what was actually happening in the landscape in a contemporary, contemporarily. Um, so here are some of the pollutants that I was researching. And then here are some of the final pieces. And that's the source imagery. These are all from that. Um, so another site-specific large wall drawing I did in the Canary Islands that looked at the pollutants there. Um, and then the next series, um, I was looking at Dutch still life painting and again using diseases and cures because Dutch still life painting looks at the cycles of life and that's something I've been interested in since the particle decay patterns are these large cycles and then how they replay at different levels. So um, this is using all sorts of diseases and all sorts of their cures to make up these paintings. Um, and then this is the first time where I started using sculpture and in making installations. Uh, it was a solo booth project at the Armory Show, and it was right after the financial collapse. And so I did a recreation of the Bank of America's waiting, corporate head um, office's waiting room, and then I layered it with imagery from Piranesi of the ruins of Rome, and then that imagery was made up of particle decay patterns. So you had all of these levels of collapse like a physical level, institutional level, and this historic collapse of an empire layered over each other. And that's a detail. Um, and then the next big installation I did, I did in the Hamptons, where I looked at the history of housing in the Hamptons and how it had changed from being the home of the home sweet home house to uh, Ira Rennert's mansion, which at the time was the largest house in the US. And the central sculpture looked at um, that proportional difference from early colonial times to the present. And that's a detail. And then the last um, show that I had uh, was based around the idea of gold and the creation of gold. Um, and I was really interested in the, the idea of gold as an element that is inherently neutral, but when humans get involved with it, it can represent all of these different things. It can represent greed, it can represent purity, it can represent beauty, um, but it's just the substance that comes from the stars, like everything does. So all of these paintings, um, the composition is based on parts of the sky that have neutron stars, which is where um, twin neutron stars, they theorized, and now they know, when they collide with each other, they create gold, they forge gold. Um, so all of the compositions are based on Hubble Space Telescope imagery, and then they're made up of particle decay patterns. So you're getting these two extreme levels of transformation, um, layered on top of each other. And then I took the Pillars of Solomon from um, the Masons because that's supposed to be the entry point into trying to um, create alchemy and get to gold. So you enter these pillars and the background is a chalkboard version of an area of the sky with twin neutron stars. And then there's some stacks of gold on the bottom. So you can kind of see how like, <laughs> This iterative process, I start doing the same things. Okay, so now we're almost at the end of this part. So this image here is the Tadpole Nebula, and it's the base imagery for that big painting where we're going to start doing the walkthrough. Um, and so nebula are where, it's where stars are born, but it's also where they've discovered that hydrocarbons are formed in the ultraviolet light. And hydrocarbons are, exist in all living things. So it's basically like the chemicals of life. 
Um, and they end up being the bonds that we need in oil to create the energy. So now we'll move <laughs> over there. No. Oh, oh, also, sorry, one more thing. This is, um, these are images of phytoplankton, which make the other alphabet that I used for this show. So you can kind of see that's what I'm looking at and drawing shapes from, and then we'll sort of point them out in these paintings. Okay, now it's the end. All right, good. Yeah. So do you, do you use slides and put them under microscopes? I am sourcing imagery from the internet and textbooks okay. and so research. No, but I would love to. You know, <laughs> under no, no. There's so much information out there that you can just find. Like people are spending their like life's research looking at, you know, the plague under an electron microscope. So I am luckily now with source the into that. yeah, Adapt can source into, into that. that. Yeah. Okay. And I used to have to go to the library, you know, like the yeah, science and industry it. library in New York. I was there like every day after work looking at stuff and now it's like you can just look for it. <laughs> anyway. So Come over here. Okay, so when I first started thinking about, um, well, it's interesting. Before Nancy came to my studio, I had been talking with someone about doing a show at a project, project space in Inglewood in Los Angeles. And to get to the space, I would always drive by these working oil wells. And I was so fascinated that like, I don't know, I grew up on the East Coast and moved to Los Angeles. And like, I thought it was so cool that I was going by these working oil wells in the middle of the city. So I, was, I thought that I wanted to do a show at that space um, about oil, because I like to make it site specific somehow. Um, but that space closed and, you know, Nancy and I started talking and I was like, well, this is perfect. It's Houston. I can, like, do my op oil opus. Um, so I can see the show as sort of this four seasons of oil, starting with its, you know, the birth of the chemicals that we need for its power in the stars. So these four pieces um, are all of... The source imagery is nebula, where hydrocarbons are born, and the alphabet is those particle decay patterns that I showed you in the first slide. So, and I really liked, especially the tadpole nebula, I liked the, the crossover with the fact that oil eventually um, is created from phytoplankton, which are microscopic sea creatures, so it's like, you know, there's this water correlation happening. Um, so I did all of these um, about the creation of hydrocarbons. And then I started thinking about, you know, the phytoplankton that these hydrocarbons end up living in, in these ancient Mesozoic oceans. And so all of the pieces that are here use as an alphabet instead of um, the particle decay patterns, they use the shapes of phytoplankton. So, and they're very simple organisms. Um, so, you know, you get a lot of like circles with, you know, the little cells in the middle. There's sort of these fluid shrimpy ones. There are these moon ones. There are these that have the like dip on either side. There's phytoplankton, yeah. Um, there's the one that look like, you know, chains. Um, there's ones that are sort of more curvy and wormy. Um, so those became, I, I kind of drew a lot of them at first, and then I filtered down into ones that I really liked drawing, and that became my basis for building up um, these paintings. And all of the ones that use phytoplankton, which are the white background ones, and then the other black ones that aren't the long goodbyes, I used as a compositional reference Monet's water lilies, because he was working at a moment um, where he was reacting to the First World War. And the First World War was really the event that created all of this technology that allowed oil to be used in uh, more ways and for everybody. So it's often refer referred to as the first oil war because it was the first time that oil really played this hugely important part um, in 
war and, and changed, you know, how we could use it. Um, and I also, and then there was the water reference as well that, you know, correlates with the plankton. So, and these are on aluminum because I wanted them to kind of float off the wall. Me, yes? Where's, where's the oil reference in this? The oil reference is through the phytoplankton. And phytoplankton are the creatures that become fossilized and then that create oil, that create oil. exactly. So this is the plankton alive. So first they're like the chemicals are born in the stars, and then they're living in the ancient, mostly Mesozoic oceans floating around. I wanted them to feel fuller and colorful and full of life and loose in a way that maybe some of the other ones don't, to, to denote that life. Are they evolving in this? I didn't think of them as evolving, but that would have been a nice element to add. <laughs> the next ones they will. Um, and so, so this whole section is like the second season, right? It's the, like the life season. So there's the birth, there's the life, um, and that encompasses all of this work through to this one. Um, and then we come into this room where they're now fossilized. So it's like the third part of this story is then they were alive, now they die. I wanted them to look still monochromatic, kind of trapped and stuck, but still beautiful and elegant because they're beautiful and elegant. Um, and I kind of thought of them like jewelry. I don't know why. They seemed like these sort of pristine still things instead of these alive, flowing things. Um, and this is chalk on blackboard again. So, you know, I, I really have these three materials that I cycle through, which is the chalk on blackboard, the watercolor on primer where it soaks in and is a little bit like fresco, and then the ink on board. Um, so after they're living this, you know, life as a fossil, they become compressed over at least 10 million years. It's the shortest amount of time it can take to make oil geologically. Um, with heat and pressure, and that moves us, sorry, it's complicated to <laughs> move around in here, um, to these paintings and the paintings on the facing or the opposite wall. This is oil liquid under the ground. So you have the black surface that, you know, references the oil in the same way it references space in the other pieces. And then you have the same shapes of the phytoplankton, but now they're kind of more um, like electric and they're full of this potency, but they're just underground um, living their best oil life until we take it out. Um, and this is using ink and nib pen, um, which is just a very fine point pen that you dip in the inkwell and they're all made flat to get this like really fast and a lean line. And these pieces I incorporated in most of them some chemical structures that are present in petroleum. So there's different hydrocarbons that exist in petroleum. I didn't use all of them. I kind of lifted the ones that were easy for me to memorize. Um, and that's, you can see, you know, here. So that's one of the things that differentiates that phase for me um, of the oil. Um, and so all of this yeah. is, is drawn from memory. You don't do a layout, background layout. No, I really work. So again, these are also using, um, sorry, I should have said, uh, Monet's water lilies again as compositional references. Mm -hmm. So I've memorized the phytoplankton shapes. They, I draw them so much that they become ingrained in me, and so I like know this alphabet in the way that you would know like, letters. Like yes, yeah, exactly. Um, and then I'm looking at the like Monet composition and pulling out elements of it as I work. And then at a certain point, probably like 80% in, I, I don't decide to do it, but I naturally see that I'm not looking at the reference as much. And then it's about making it its own object that exists for itself, um, you know, in the best way. Um, so then if we walk back around.
These are more from that same series and idea about oil underground based on Monet. Um, and I, when I was thinking about the whole show, because I really thought about it all at once, I was imagining that wall and these two walls as kind of the anchor points. And I always wanted these two to live across from each other. So I was looking for compositions in the, the star area and in the Monet's that would have correlations. So you'll see that in both of them there's sort of this like curtaining effect from the top coming down and that really the movement exists around the sides and then there are these sort of central elements in both of the paintings. So I really thought about finding something that you know, would cross the boundaries um, and, and allow them to have this conversation between each other. And then the last and final phase is this centerpiece um, where it's about extraction. So the these are all, I made these clay, clay phytoplankton. Um, I was very excited to find black Mardi Gras beads that could live as the kind of beaded plankton um, and I in my head knew that I wanted to do something excuse me proportional like I did in the Hamptons and I watched all these documentaries on oil and I was reading books on energy and um, reading like Royal Dutch Shell does these amazing sort of prediction models BP does too anyway um, I wanted to look at the current understanding of uh, when we might run out of the known oil reserves, of course they may find more, um, and how much time it took to create the oil geologically. So as I said before, the shortest amount of time that oil can be created geologically is 10 million years. And there's a BP model that predicts that at the current rate of extraction and use, um, 2063 is when we would run out of the oil that we know of right now. Um, and from the moment that there was the first oil well in 1858 to 2063 is uh, 204 years. So the proportional difference is 10 million to 204, with this being the creation and this being the extraction. Um, so this is just a pop up, it's a one time. Right? Yeah, I mean, it could be recreated, like yeah, packed up I mean, and rolled up. That's just been created for this. Event. Yes, exactly. In fact, all of the work, except for those two, which are also of Nebula, that I had done before, everything is created specifically for this show with this idea in mind mm -hmm. as like a cycle. But someone couldn't purchase this. They, they could, could, yeah. They could purchase this concept. They would, could purchase this actual stuff, Today. To, and then it would be packed up, and I mean, it could even be like, I could, you know, if it could be a string and a slightly smaller But it would thing, have to be laid back out again. It would be, be laid back out again. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, right, so it wouldn't be like... Roll it yes. up. Yes, yeah. Like <laughs> no, 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 so it would have unique, to be... This, this is unique. unique, yes, and it could be reinstalled, but every time it's going to be installed, the it'll be, the motion will be slightly different on the floor. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. Yeah. So, you know, that's a one time. That's pretty exciting. Thank you. Um, yeah, so this is my oil opus. <laughs> <laughs> yes. They are looking at, I am super, I literally lift it from what I'm looking at. To a point, again, to a point. So like, I am looking, like the Hubble Space photograph I showed you of the Tadpole Nebula, I'm looking, there's blues here, there's reds here, it's brighter here, there's a little green here, but I want more so I can pull it out. So like, it's guided completely by my reference material. Um, and then again at some point, like with those Monets, like the reference was like, where is their blue? Where is their yellow? But then it becomes about like, oh, I want this to be brighter here and I'm gonna put fluorescent pink here. And, and then it's just a conversation with like me and the piece. Um, but yeah, you, I'm starting with the source material. Cause yeah, it's, it makes it less scary. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> an element of control. Yeah, exactly. Like, I, I like rules. Yes. I like boundaries. And if I can give them to myself, yes. then I will find a way to do that. So. That's how nature works, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> um, any other questions? Or? So you were saying in the disease and the cure, yeah. there was that reference there, and you were doing the battle scene. Yeah. So you made sense, but why did you choose Monet again as your, your inspiration? Two for reasons. Um, one, because of the water reference. And that related to the fight, the plankton, which live in the water, which are ocean creatures. So I liked that. And then because of the time that he was making the pieces, was really a kind of at the beginning of when oil was becoming like just used for everything. And that was solidified by World War I. And then he was making them in response to World War I. So it started with the water in the period. And then it became even better when I realized like that he had made them in response to World War I. And then I was reading about the history of oil and that World War I was so important to that transformation and how we use energy. Um, you know, and we're kind of at that other end where there's always these ages of energy and they cycle through time. And we're, I think that we, you know, we're coming to the end of that age of energy and into another age of energy. And it's also a substance that is beautiful and inherently neutral. And then humans get involved in, and then it becomes this complicated thing. But like nature is just kind of like amazing. <laughs> You know, so whatever it is. So, nice. any other? Okay, great. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>